All right. This is the Healthy Hustling Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Broadworth, and I am joined today with Dr. Trent Nessler. Dr. Trent Nessler is a physical therapist and has just a wealth of knowledge. He's the founder and developer of the V-Perform AMI and the V-Perform AMI Return to Sport and ACL Play It Safe and Run Safe apps. Uh, Dr. Nessler has 23, over 23 years in sports medicine, and he has recently uh, joined Rebound Vitality and is their president and working with a lot of first responders, police, firefighters, and helping with injury prevention there, and really taking from the professional sports realm, taking that over into uh, the first responders and our tactical athletes, as we like to call them. So thanks so much for joining, Trent. Yeah, and thank you, Eric, for having me. I appreciate it. Awesome. So um, we'll get right into this. So we're going to talk a lot about, for those of you who don't know what blood flow restriction training is, you're going to learn more about it here today. And uh, really Trent's experience, not only the research side that he has, but he's recently been going through an injury and he's going to talk a little bit about that. But Trent, do you want to hit on what is blood flow restriction training or BFR for those of um, people listening who don't know what that is? Sure. Sure. You know, and and people hear about BFR and they think this is a new and amazing technique and it's actually been around since the sixties, you know, and it, it really kind of hit, it actually comes out of Japan from Dr. Sato. um, And it really, uh, really started in the fitness industry. Um, I remember seeing old pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Franco Colombo wrapping wraps around their arms and doing bicep curls. And that was actually a very rudimentary form of blood flow restriction training. Why did they do it? Because they knew it worked. Um, It really kind of got somewhat of a resurgence uh, in 2014 when there was an ESPN story uh, on a guy by by a PT uh, by the name of Johnny Owens in what he was doing uh, at the uh, Center for the Intrepid. And that's where they, they, they rehab warriors uh, who come from Afghanistan and Iraq and um, who've lost a limb or whatever. And basically he was using blood flow restriction training to help expedite their rehab and get them back to, uh, back to the battle, so to speak. Oh, wow. So, yeah, go going back to the bodybuilders, Um, you know, I definitely, you can see people online still doing that and taking essentially bands and it's not really the safest way to implement blood flow restriction training by wrapping a bunch of bands. So your arms turning purple while you're trying to do some bicep curls and get a pump. Uh, what do you recommend as far as safety? You know, that's a great question because, you know, it has, uh, somewhat taken off in fitness in, in what I don't recommend you know, is using narrow straps. There's a lot of straps out there that people are using. Um, there's the, the, the rubber straps that they're using. You know, I think that's used a lot in CrossFit. You know, the problem is, is that you can get those th- things so tight that they can actually completely occlude. Yeah. Um, there are some devices out there uh, in full transparency. I do a lot of work with rock cuffs. Um, it's the device that I use. It's the device I'm using for my personal rehab. And the reason I like it is it does not fully occlude. Um, so you, you're not going to cut off blood flow to the limb. You know, you can still get the, the full benefit, but you're not even getting close to full occlusion. Um, and so in, in, in some clinics, there are devices that do fully occlude. There's actually two on the market, the Delphi unit uh, as well as smart tools. And then there's other units out there like B strong rock cuffs and, and, and multiple others that don't fully occlude. So if you have a device that fully occludes, I highly recommend you only do that under medical supervision um, because that really needs someone who's trained in that, who understands it, knows what the clinical signs you need to look for, et cetera. Um, But more of your devices like your B-Strong and your rock cuffs, you can actually use those in a fitness setting. The thing I like about the the, uh, rock cuff is you're not going to get close to fully occluding and you you can still get a good workout with it. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I have a set that I use with my patients and blood flow restriction training has been a game changer when people aren't uh, uh, appropriate for heavy loads. And yet we're getting that workout on the muscle. It's that same, that same strain on the muscle tissue. And uh, it's 30%. If if you're working 30% of your one rep max, Yep. It's the same as getting that, uh, working it at 80%, uh, yep. 
And obviously, so you let's, know more. Let's, yeah, let's talk about that for a second, because, you know, the beauty of BFR is that you get the same uh, training effect that you would get with heavy resistance training. When I say heavy resistance training, I'm talking 80 to 85% of one RM or one rep max. Um, you can do with BFR, you can do 20 to 40% of one RM and still get the same workout in the same uh, physiological response that you would get with heavier loads. You know, so for, you know, your post-op rehabs, man, it's awesome because you can get their full quad recruitment. So just very briefly to, to kind of explain to people how that actually works. So you do not block uh, arterial inflow. What you do is you block venous return. So what then happens is that you're blocking the blood from leaving the muscle. So as more and more blood comes into the muscle, you reach the muscle's capacity to actually take in anymore. So what ends up happening is now you have this oxygen depletion because you're using all the oxygen off the blood that's there. No more blood is coming in. So the muscle starts to become fatigued. And then what that ha what happens with that is you start recruiting more motor units. And what that means is more of the full muscle is recruited. Typically you have to do heavy, heavy resistance loads to get that kind of recruitment. And now we're able to do that when you're only using 20 to 30% of your one RM. But the additional piece of that is, is what happens biochemically and biochemically what happens because you get this change in your pH, you have stimulation of the liver, you get a release of growth hormone and you get a release of IGF-1. IGF-1 and growth hormone both help with muscle growth. IGF-1 also helps with stimulating bone growth. So for our geriatric patients, that's awesome because you can actually make their bones stronger by getting this IGF-1 release. But the third thing that happens biochemically is you have myostatin suppression. And so through that myostatin suppression, that's kind of the, the chemical that limits muscle growth. So the cool thing is, is that limiter, the, the limiter is being reduced while all the things that cause you to grow are being increased and you're doing this at much lower loads. So yeah. the beauty of this is, is that you can do that with your geriatric patients, your post-operative patients, you can do it on recovery days. It's just, you know, it's, it's amazing. I, I, the more I use it, the more I love it. Yeah. I, the effects have, have honestly been game changing and like nothing short of that because with my ACL patients who they went through ACL rehab, they're not appropriate for getting under a heavy load yet. Starting off with straight leg raises, we're able to, in something as simple as that, we're able to decrease the amount of quad atrophy that they are getting, which we know plays a significant role in their ability to get back and their ability to function. And going from that type of athlete too, and you mentioned geriatrics, um, it has a huge improvement in our older population and improving their strength, improving their endurance, and also improving their ability to balance and decrease fall risks have yes. been uh, associated with it. So really Absolutely. remarkable. Well, you know, in, 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 in 23, I'll say 23 plus years of practice, um, two game changers. One was this movement assessment thing that came out and the other one is this BFR thing. Yeah. You know, to me, those have been total game changers because it's really altered the way that we practice. And, and the funny thing is, you know, on Instagram, you know, because of my Instagram tag, um, I constantly get people uh, reaching out to me about ACL injuries. And I am, I am shocked at how many PTs out there are still not using uh, BFR as a part of their ACL rehab. And in some pretty well-known places, you know, and, and so what I always tell people, if, you're, if your PT is not doing BFR as a part of your ACL rehab, I hate to say this, but I say you need to probably be looking elsewhere because they're not keeping up on the latest research. And it's not that expensive to do. It's, it kills me because it's not that expensive. Um, and we could go down a whole rabbit hole with that because I get the same thing. I get people three years post-op or even one year post-op who haven't even started running yet, who are still having issues. Like, I had a guy last year who'd reached out to me who still, he had not started running yet and he was a year out. And I'm like, dude, you are way behind. Like, I hate to say this, but like, you need serious care. And then you have these people who they're three years out and they're still having knee issues because they were never appropriately loaded. They were never tested. I'm like, were you doing any jumping? Oh no, I wasn't even, the agility ladder was never even brought out. I'm like, 
Right. How, anyway, we go down a whole rabbit hole <laughs> there, but so, um, we talked a little bit about the BFR. Tell us about your, so you recently had a knee injury. And for those of you who don't know, backing up the bus a little bit, um, Trent's Instagram handle is BJJ ACL guy. I, is that correct? BJPT slash ACL guy. Yeah. And so, um, uh, Trent is huge into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So take us a little bit about your, over your recent injury sure. and how you've been rehabbing that. Sure. Sure. So, uh, you know, I've been practicing jujitsu for eight years now and, uh, I got with a, uh, a competitor that was, uh, basically did an illegal move. Um, he put one foot below my tibial plateau, grabbed a hold of my foot, pushed with his foot and pulled with his hand. So he basically did a various gapping of my knee. So what resulted was, uh, an LCL tear posterior lateral corner tear, uh, and, uh, unfortunately a lateral meniscal tear. And so, you know, for me, um, you know, I, I've been using BFR. I have a Norma tech at home. I've been using that for two hours a night to bring my swelling down. You know, it's funny because I was having a really, I went on crutches. I was on crutches in a straight leg brace it was supposed to be for two weeks. I uh, got off crutches and no brace in about four days. Um, <laughs> I, I remember yeah. your post saying that saying doc yeah. wants me in it for at least yeah two weeks. And you're like, yeah. I think day three, day four, this is coming up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and again, I'm, what I'm trying to use is the logic that we would use with any of our patients. I'm pushing myself a little bit harder. Um, I was doing really, really well. Um, I actually started to, um, uh, so all of this happened around the 16th by Thanksgiving, um, I was able to do an hour on an elliptical. Um, I was doing uh, what are called switch kicks. Uh, so where you switch over from one leg to the other to the heavy bag. So yeah. I, was, I just started doing my switch kicks. My problem was I went to Milwaukee uh, for work uh, for a week. We were pulling 16 hour days. I was sleeping very little, still working out. Um, I, was treat I was actually training for a uh, charity uh, event called Tap Out for Cancer. And that was supposed to be on Saturday, the 12th. And so um, what, one of the things I did is I got a functional trainer that, that it hooks resistance to your hands, to your legs. Um, and I put BFR on, and then I did uh, an hour on the heavy bag. It was probably a little too much. I jumped it up a little, you know, I probably should have done a couple of steps to that. A little too aggressive. I, yeah, it was a little too aggressive. And then I was doing stairs and I, I my hotel was two blocks away and, you know, it was cold. And, and by the time I got home, I couldn't walk. So I was back on a crutch, um, just got off a crutch on uh, Monday, yesterday. Um, but I've been doing BFR um, the whole way through. You know, one of the things that BFR is really good for is cardio. Mm -hmm. And so anybody that knows jujitsu knows that cardio, I mean, we do, you know, a typical fight is five, five minute rounds, uh, typically between two and three. So your cardio has got to be really top notch and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep my cardio up. So one of the things I do is I get on the bike, um, I crank up to 150 millimeters of mercury, uh, pressure wise. And then, you know, I take my, my load, I'm, I'm probably running a little bit higher load. So I'm about 40% of my VO2 max. Um, and then I'm doing that for 30 minutes. I'll do five minutes on five minutes off, five minutes on five minutes off, five minutes on five minutes off. Um, and then, then like, you know, yesterday, uh, was leg day. So I did BFR leg extensions. Uh, I did some body weight squats, single leg, leg extensions. And then, uh, I went into more fatigue straight, uh, fatigue state training stuff. Uh, and that was more of my jujitsu specific, some bridges, some hip escapes, uh, some technical get-ups and things like that. Really trying to, you know, put BFR in as much as I can, and it helps. You know, yeah. I went from last Saturday not being able to walk on a crutch uh, to Monday yesterday got off the crutch, walking with no limp. Uh, you know, I still have a little bit of pain. I'm going to take it a little bit slower. You know, I probably will not get on the mats this weekend. Uh, the mats being back into jujitsu, um, but I probably will definitely do it uh, the week of Christmas. Nice. Yeah test it out a little bit. Yeah. It, yeah. No, it sounds like you're doing really well because, um, th that is quite the timeline for sure. Right. You know, but, for that type of an injury too. I mean, it was only a grade two, so it wasn't yeah. anything very significant. I have no rotational instability, you know? So again, I think that's, you know, it's, it's an aggressive timeline. 
Yeah. And did um, you say that poster lateral corner, I believe you said in one of your posts healed up, right? That that's looking good now. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah, yeah. You know, <clears throat> it's stable. Uh, I had a surgical consult after the uh, flare up uh, when I got back and uh, you know, he, he said, everything feels fine. Everything's, you know, it's pretty secure. Um, you know, the, the, one of the problems was, is that when I got home, I got all flared up my knee was really swollen. I was trying to change a pair of shorts and I, my knee popped and I fell. Ooh. And that's, that's what I think tore my lateral meniscus. So. Okay. But it is what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's definitely a rough go. And um, those posterior lateral corners, it's definitely a good thing that you caught that because as you know, that can often go missed mm -hmm. um, if you're not, not doing yeah. what you need to be doing as far as like kind of catching that yeah. uh, you know, at least in the ACL injury population. Absolutely. And you bring out a good point too. You know, the, the, the good thing is, is that I've, I, I know who I should go to. I've got good connections. Um, I've got a primary care sports medicine fellowship trained sports medicine doc that I go to. Um, I was able to, uh, after the injury, I got into him in 24 hours, went in there, he did a diagnostic ultrasound on me kind of determined what it was, came up with a plan of cure, you know, and, and then after the flare up, you know, um, I've got, an, again, another connection with an orthopedic surgeon, called them, got in 24 hours, um, was able to get a surgical consult. So, you know, expediting that cure has been very beneficial. Um, yeah. and two, making sure, you, as you know, getting with the right docs. I mean, you know, some docs don't know how to differential diagnose. No, and that's huge. And, uh, <clears throat> A lot of times you have to be, you know, uh, when it comes to patients, like you really have to speak up for yourself. And don't if you don't trust, if you don't trust who you're going to, yeah. you need to go to someone that you can trust or get a second opinion. Because I, I tell my patients this when they're like, well, you know, I'm not quite sure I go, look, if you don't, if you want to go get a second opinion, you are not going to hurt my feelings. I said, if any PT, if any MD, if anyone gets upset about you getting a second opinion, then uh, that's an, that's an issue because then they're, they're in it to get you better. That's why you get into healthcare is to get other people better and getting a second opinion. Um, it doesn't hurt to get another set of eyes on it. And if they trust you, they're going to come back. And if they don't, then it just wasn't the right match. So, sure. well, you know, in, in, you know, to your, to your point too, you know, um, being able to communicate uh, is vital, you know, and I always tell patients that if, if you felt like you couldn't ask questions and you felt like you couldn't get your things answered that you wanted answered in the initial visit, what is going to happen when you have a complication during surgery? Mm -hmm. So being able to have that open communication with whoever your healthcare provider is, is really important. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, that you, you bring up a really good point there. Um, so have you utilized, so we haven't talked much about it, but the technology that you were talking about, it's the Dorsa V. So the, uh, the Dorsa V athletic movement index is a 3d technology sensor that you hook up to a computer and it can measure all sorts of range of motion and has been, um, as you've said, a, a game changer. And it really has in being able to identify athletes who are at risk for a lower body injury and was originally intended to identify those at risk for ACL injuries. Have you tested yourself out with that yet? Uh, no. Okay. No, because, because I'm, I, uh, quite honestly, I can't hop yet. Yeah. I didn't so, know if you did the modified version yet. No, no not yet. One, well, two, you know, um, quite honestly, I've got six systems sitting in my office but I'm the only one that can run them. So <laughs> <laughs> that does make it a little harder. I never even Being thought about that. Bar running back and doing it and then going back <laughs> and space bar is just not working for me. So yeah, um, you just need so one of those two, buttons. I, yeah. You know, and two, the, you know, the other, the other caveat to that is, is that all my training is around focusing on improving results on that, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, the, uh, eventually I will test myself or I'll have someone test me. Um, I've actually got a new staff member that's uh, doing the testing with me. Okay, um, I'll have her test me once I can, once I can do hopping fully. Nice, yeah. So through that, just so people uh, kind of a brief background on what is measured, it's uh, squat, plank, side plank, single leg hop, uh, and then hopping in multiple directions on one leg. So front, back, side, side, 
and then ankle range of motion. And with all of those measurements, those are all really key things at identifying one, is there a difference from side to side Two, what's the quality of motion look like? And, um, what is that person's risk? And we can actually put a number on it on what their risk is for a lower body injury. Uh, and then what kind of program should you be on to fix that? So, and decrease that risk. You know, and the, the beauty, you know, I'll say real quick, the beauty uh, right now is, is we've done over 25,000 athletes. Um, we now have a research study going on looking at uh, the EMI and correlating that to the TSK-11. We're seeing a strong correlation that poor performance on TSK-11, Tampa scale for kinesiophobia 11 form, um, which is often used for return to play after ACL reconstruction. We're seeing a strong correlation with poor performance on that test. Um, and AMI. And when we improve AMI results, we see improvements in TSK-11. So that's a study we're doing with ASMI right now. We also have another study that we're doing where we're looking at early intervention of BFR um, uh, and how that impacts biomechanics and comparing those to those who've not had BFR. And we're seeing some pretty significant results in frontal plane control. Interesting. Is that uh, like long-term, short-term, how far out? Uh, so we are, we are starting uh, implementation at two weeks um, and at looking them uh, at the nine month mark, comparing one group to the other. So yeah. the implementation of the BFR, um, have them go uh, until their nine month uh, uh, return to play assessment uh, and then going from there. Yeah, that'll be really cool to see. I'll be interested. I'll be looking out for that. Um, so you've also been, you, we haven't hit on this at all, but so you've used blood flow restriction training, uh, the norm attack, which for those of you who don't know, those are compression sleeves that mimic your body's muscle pump to help promote circulation and healing, uh, and decreasing swelling. But you've also been using a grade four laser, um, out of all of those, what would you say is the, if you had to pick just one to go with, what would it be? Just curious. I would say blood flow restriction training because um, across the across the spectrum of how I can use it, um, I would say a major another game changer is the class four laser. Um, it's it is done amazing. You know, I I uh, uh, I was first introduced to that in Birmingham uh, with Kevin. Yeah. You know, um, and how he was using. It. I actually had a couple of injuries that uh, I would go into the clinic and and have him treat treat me you know, <laughs> on the side with. Yeah. Uh, but, but I've got a clinic here in Nashville, Tennessee, that's got one that I'm doing on a, on a semi-regular basis. And I notice immediately, you know, whether that's subconscious or whatever, I, I notice immediately an increase in my range of motion. My, my, if I'm limping, it gets better. My pain goes down. Um, and so it's, it's been a major game changer for me. Awesome. Yeah. I haven't, uh, used, I, I've never had access to a grade four laser, but I have heard from those that do that they see really, really good results, uh, in injuries and, um, even like arthritic patients and being able to help them as well. So again, kind of treating that full spectrum. Um, how long till you think you're going to be back to BJJ? Uh, next week. <laughs> Full Fully? What no, not think? fully. Uh, fully, probably uh, first of the year. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the hardest part for me is uh, stand up um, because, you know, you got like a lot of judo throws, yep. uh, uh, double leg takedowns, stuff like that. I'm still having a hard time with that. And then, you know, also, you know, for those that know jujitsu, it's a lot of leg game, you know, so you're, you're hooking your feet on people, pulling them forward, pushing them back, you know, and, and if, you know, as you go up uh, in the sport, um, you tend to be more, you use your legs a lot more. Um, and you know, that's, that's my right leg is my strong leg. Uh, and right now it's my weak leg. So you yeah, know, I have to put that back fully, but yeah. I would like probably the first, first of the year we're December 16th. Yeah. First of the year. Which nice. Is yeah. We're, we're two weeks time. out. Yeah. It's still an aggressive timeline, but to be honest with you and to your point, I mean, I don't use just one thing. Mm -hmm. them all, you know, right. one of the other things I've been using is called black oxygen, which is a supplement. Um, it's, um, Oh, fervic acid or something like that. It comes from, it comes from the, uh, uh, it comes from dirt, a particular type of dirt. It's used a lot in the UFC for recovery. Huh. Um, that's where I first came across it. A, a PT friend of mine who works for the UFC 
actually turned me on to it. And I've been using that. And I noticed when I got off it that things were sore, that I wasn't recovering as quickly. I'm back on it now and I'm, I'm noticing a difference. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I saw, saw you posted about the black oxygen. I've, yeah. I'm not too familiar with it, um, but I think when it comes to supplements, some of those can definitely make a difference. You just, I think, got to do your homework as far as yep. uh, what supplements are going to work yep. and making sure that you're using the right stuff and not necessarily some some garbage that is out there, which gives everything a bad name. But in a, And I'll tell you just two more things real quick, and I apologize because I know we're going a little bit over. Oh, you're good. The other thing that, you know, is, and you may have seen this on my post the other day, but I talked about hydration. Yep. That's a critical part. I mean, I, I'm, I'm super strict on hydration. You know, the other thing is nutrition. You know, um, I actually use a company called Trifecta, which are pre, pre-packaged meals. They're highly nutritious, organic, no additives, no preservatives. To me, it's, it's the, to accelerate the rehab process is about using all the tools that are available. So, you know, I'm trying to use the right supplements. I'm trying to use the right compression sleeves. I'm trying to use the BFR, the laser hydration, nutrition, all of it to me is, is, is super important. I, I don't think we do enough. And I know that I could be better at this with talking to my patients about that whole package. So, um, I'll talk about obviously the exercises someone needs to be doing. I'll hit on hydration, especially when people start to be, start to cramp up. A lot of times I find that it's a hydration issue. Uh, but the nutrition aspect, there is more and more research coming out about whether you're post-op or just dealing with any type of injury. Nutrition is key. And if you're putting junk into your body, it's going to take so much longer. Three to four weeks longer. You know, and so, you know, one of the things uh, for your followers, um, I just did a a blog for Sports Ed TV. So I do a blog for them once a week. And this most recent blog is actually on avoiding the pitfalls of rehab. And I talk about nutrition. I talk about hydration. I talk about being persistent. What I mean by that is, you know, if you normally go to the gym at 3 a.m. in the morning during rehab, people don't usually do that. Well, why not? You can still go there. You can still do the bike. You can still do those things because it keeps your body in that rhythm, Uh the normal rhythm that you're used to. And once you get outside of that rhythm, things start jacking up. Yeah, no, you're right. You start sitting down watching too much Netflix and you're not doing what you need to do to um, keep your body moving and hitting on what you said, as far as like getting in that rhythm, a lot of it's mindset. Uh, and having that right mindset and my patients who are super successful and they get good outcomes, they've got a positive mindset. They do what you tell them to do. And honestly, they'll go above and beyond and and they'll come back to me and they'll be like, Oh, I looked up this, this, and this. And what do you think about this? You know, what do you think about black oxygen or CBD oil or all of these things? So, um, yeah, no, I, I think that's really good stuff. Uh, is there, I, and I know that we're definitely, uh, you're on a bit of a time crunch here. Is there anything else that you really wanted to hit on? I think this is all really good information for anyone wanting to know anything about BFR or overcoming knee injuries and that kind of thing. You know, I, you know, again, I think, you know, the, uh, in, and we both touched on it and that is the whole body approach, you know, and, and that's one of the reasons I did that blog because, you know, I think coming from this, from the from the PT side, but also, you know, athlete side, you know, um, I've had a lot of people ask me like, dude, how are you progressing so fast? Well, you know what? I I try to do all the right things. I mean, I do the things that that you and I tell people to do, right. I'm doing my Normatec, my BFR, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing all of these things. And when you do them all in conjunction, you actually do, it works, you know, Like I was telling one of my PT buddies, like, like all the stuff that we tell patients to do, it actually works. Like, <laughs> yeah, it works. It's, like it's, it's, it's amazing. You yeah. put some like uh, research behind it yeah. and all this stuff. And like, you do what you're supposed to do. You're going to have better outcomes. You know, and it's been a little frustrating for me because I feel like I'm, I'm progressing slower, but I'm also, you know, I'm 51 years old, you know, I'm, I'm going to progress a little bit slower, but even then I think it's, it's doing well. Oh, again, yeah. It's because all I'm trying to keep all the components in check. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, it sounds like you're doing a really good job at it. And uh, yeah, two more weeks, you're back on the map full time. Knock on wood. Cool. 
Well, thanks so much, Trent. Uh, I'll let you go here. We'll talk soon and uh, keep in keep in contact for sure. And have a great rest of your night. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Have a great awesome. evening. Thanks. See ya.